Today, I will explore with you a debate, a debate that scholars have long dwelt upon. Before I proceed to talk about the debate, I would like to do a little survey here. I would like to ask, when you guys read a text, view a theater performance, or enjoy a painting, how many of you think that it is important for you to learn the message that the author wants to carry through before making a personal interpretation? Can I have a show of hands? Okay. Thank you. So, for those who raise their hands just now, I would like you to bear in mind one question throughout the presentation. How do we balance between freedom of interpretation and the constriction of authorial intention? Hopefully, by the end of the presentation, we will have some outcomes. So, the core of the debate that I'm going to deal with today really lies in two kinds of theories put forward by two groups of academics. The authorial intentionalists believe that the author's intended message is indispensable in guiding our interpretation of art. On the other hand, another group of scholars has another view on the same topic about interpretation, and they propose intentional fallacy. Basically, intentional, intentional fallacy states that the design or intention of the author is insignificant as a standard for interpreting a work of art. A famous supporter of intentional fallacy is a very famous Roland Barthes, who once said, the author is dead. I'm sure most of you have heard it before. So what does it mean to me? To me, it means that the birth of the reader, once we receive a work of art, it's a death of the author. It doesn't matter what the, what the author thinks anymore. It matters how you interpret the piece of art. In dealing with a clash of these two really different knowledge paradigms today, I have decided to put particular emphasis on music as a major component of the area of knowledge, arts. Thus, I came up with a knowledge issue. To what extent can musical interpretation be accomplished with a disregard for authorial intention? First, let me introduce you to my um, real life situation that inspired this central knowledge issue. Full 33, a really mysterious name, right? In fact, in 1952, John Cage wrote a piece called Full 33, and guess what? It's a blank score that instructs performers not to play anything throughout the entirety of the 4 minutes and 33 seconds performing on stage. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you right now will be dying to question, well, what does he try to channel through? What is his message? What is he trying to get at by giving us a blank score? Well, I assure you that when I first experienced 433, I had the same question. But really, what really got me further thinking was, well, is the message important at all? Why is the author's message important? In an interview with John Cage, she expresses that 433 is really an invitation. By invitation, he means that it invites listeners to make their own version of music by incorporating sounds around them and incorporating emotions that belong to themselves. In other words, no people, no two people, will feel the same way about 433, depending on factors like the external environment they are in, the cultural upbringing, belief they are of, and even ancient experience they have. So, to relate this really back to our knowledge issue, it is appropriate to say that Full 33 is an example of the relative unimportance of authorial intention in guiding our musical interpretation because we are the ones who decide what we want to get from the experience, not John Cage. For me as a thinker, my interpretation of Full 33 is really guided by my sense of perception. It struck me how 433 challenged what a hearing sense of perception is always accustomed to, to hear a sound. I would just like to ask one of you, what do you how do you define your hearing music? Anyone? Melody. Melody, okay. That's the thing about a lot of the answers uh, people give me. I hear melody. But then we really recognize that Music is made up of silence and sound. So why do we always define hearing music as hearing the sound part, but not silence? Because without silence, there is no music. Without silence, there is no sound. So this elongated silence, for me at least, I don't know for you, it really creates a central disorientation within me. It really 
disorientated my hearing sense of perception. And in sense, this led to an emotional agitation. And these two ways of knowing work together to create a discomfort within me that further made me reflect on my interpretation of 433 as a political satire. It made me imagine a similar kind of emotional agitation, of discomfort, that many people will feel living under a lack of freedom of speech, like the instrumentalists who are unable to play, they are unable to voice out their true feelings. I am aware, though, that my personal interpretation is highly structured on my cultural upbringing, because perhaps I live in Hong Kong, a democracy, I am frequently exposed to the concept of freedom of speech, whether in lesson or in the news, etc. However, it might be possible that if I randomly choose a person from a farm, then he might not be as exposed to the idea of freedom of speech, and he might not interpret the song sanely. He might not even interpret the song in a political way. So, indeed, we all live in such different cultural knowledge paradigms that make musical interpretation so full of possibilities, so varied. I know when I alluded to political satire, some of you are thinking, well, wait a second, is this a little bit too far stretched? But I think this is the whole point about musical interpretation. It's about you taking in the music, analyzing it with your ways of knowing, and coming at a personal interpretation. However, I also understand that it's time for us to really view music in a holistic perspective. Full 33, after all, is a contemporary music, and there are all sorts of different kinds of music that we haven't considered yet. So this really led me to consider the extended knowledge issue. Does some genre of music require the audience to be cognizant, to be aware of the authorial intention? So indeed, some genres of music are based significantly on the context and authorial intention. They don't really allow listeners as much freedom of interpretation. A really good real life example, I think, would be the propaganda music during the Chinese Revolution, uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution, because I feel that the message of nationalism and the idealistic message of anti-capitalism is so hugely in, embedded in the music that it's really difficult for us to actually interpret the song without having a subconscious awareness of what the author is trying to say, the intention of the author. So, as opposed to Cage's support of freedom of musical interpretation, I would like to quote from uh, Marxist critique, Raymond William, who justifies authorial intention in works of art by saying that a disregard for the author's authorial intention would mean a communication mishap between audience and the artist. But then I would like to ask you on an ethical dimension, whether you think that anyone really has the power to decide how you interpret a piece does the artist have the power, in fact? Does anyone want to answer this question? He can write mm -hmm. down what he wishes to give out mm -hmm. with the music. Yes, definitely. So he can say what he intends, but he, he can't really control, right? OK. So um, I would like to also consider another area of knowledge I would like to compare the application of authorial intention in literature and music by asking, now, what is the difference between music and literature? And does this discrepancy enhance the application of interpretational freedom in musical appreciation? Well, the greatest difference between literature and music, I think, is that there is a major way of knowing in literature, and that is language. Language can often stratify our interpretation, because often the author's message is put literally on the page. While music is a lot more open-ended, it can uh, allow a lot more interpretations. For example, if a writer writes, I am happy on the page, a composer might have la 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 to channel the happiness. And we immediately see how la 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 can allow a lot more different interpretations. However, I am also aware that some genres of music have lyrics within. So that would in, uh, inadvertently allow a little bit, like, allow a little bit less um, freedom of interpretation. So today, I have presented with, with, uh, to you two genres of music, Full 33 contemporary music and propaganda music. And we see that Full 33 allows a lot of interpretational freedom, and we see that Propaganda music requires a lot of awareness of authorial intention.
You might ask, well, is there a healthy balance? And the answer is yes, indeed. It doesn't always have to be strictly just authority of intention or interpretation of freedom. For example, this summer, I went to a contemporary drama, and at the end of the drama, I was in a Q&A session, and I really asked the playwright, well, okay, what is your intended message behind the drama? So that I can really cross-reference my personal interpretation with his, so that I can come up with a more all-encompassing interpretation. So this can really be applied back to music, back to our initial knowledge issue, that I believe that depending on the genre of music, authority of intention plays different degrees of significance. But whenever we can, we should definitely consider both personal interpretation and the author's message to form a more comprehensive interpretation. Questions? 